Say, I wonder what Paul's got up his sleeve. Said he wanted us to wait around till he got here. Yeah, you got me, Ed. You know, he did mention something about transmission. I wonder... Give that man nine silver dollars and two tickets to next month's tech film. And if you've got transmission problems on your mind, I want to listen in. Let's go. Now, here's the first problem. The owner of this car with the hydraulically operated transmission says it's slow on the upshift. Huh. Well, that doesn't sound like a problem. It's got to be in the transmission. And a dime will get you a buck. It don't have to be. Right, Tech. Sounds like you got a safe bet. In fact, it's pretty apt to be caused by the engine. Whoa, let's go over that slow light. How can it be the engine? Easy, Ed. The engine's running too fast to let the transmission make the shift when the owner thinks it should. Tell him about it, Paul. <laughs> okay, Tech. Actually, the engine doesn't slow down enough to relieve the torque on the gears so the shift can be completed promptly. Well, wouldn't setting the idle speed right correct the trouble? Oh, in some cases, yes. But you'll usually find that slow upshift is caused by sticking throttle linkage. You know, speaking of sticking linkage, I've been guilty myself of going off half-cocked and blaming the transmission for troubles that I should have pinned down to sticking throttle linkage. Oh, I guess most of us have, Mike. Actually, cleaning the linkage thoroughly with a good solvent and then blowing out the dirt and oil and solvent with compressed air will usually do the job. Right. But you never want to oil that throttle linkage. A lot of us mechanics have the habit of thinking that oil makes things work better. Well, most of the time, that's right. But not with throttle linkage. Right you are, Tech. Oil collects dust, which keeps the linkage from working free and easy. But getting back to your remark about correct idle speed, Ed, it is a good idea to check engine idle speed and set it right after you get the linkage clean. But you want to remember that this slow upshift condition we've been talking about is due to incorrect engine idle speed and is not the fault of the transmission. That's right, Tech. We don't want to blame the transmission for anything that isn't its fault. And now, while we're talking about transmissions... Did you ever have a customer come in and tell you that his hydraulically operated transmission is noisy when he shifts to neutral and lets his car coast to a stop? Yeah. What causes the noise? That noise he hears is the direct speed clutch sleeve moving back and forth. We call that shuttling, Ed. And it's not the fault of the transmission. Not the fault of the transmission? Oh, wait a minute. Don't tell me that's the fault of the engine, too. No, not the engine either. Explain it to him, Paul. Shuttling is a condition brought about by driving the car with the transmission in neutral. It isn't supposed to be operated that way. How come the direct speed clutch sleeve shuttles when you coast in neutral? Simple, Ed. When the driver shifts into neutral, the countershaft gear and the governor slow down to engine idle speed. That calls for a downshift. So the direct speed clutch sleeve moves back off the main drive pinion. As soon as that happens, oil and friction drag between the main shaft and the countershaft gear causes the rear wheels to turn the countershaft gear and governor faster than the engine idle speed. So the governor calls for an upshift. Get it? Yeah, now I get it. The countershaft gear can speed up faster than the engine because of the overrunning clutch in the constant mesh gear. Right, Tech? Right on the nose, my boy. You can see that the direct speed clutch sleeve shuttling back and forth is what's making the noise. And it's because the car is coasting with the transmission in neutral. Coasting with the transmission in neutral certainly isn't good driving practice. But don't ask me why some people do it. I don't have the answer. Somebody ought to tell them that leaving the transmission in gear gives them the advantage of the braking effect of the engine and saves wear on the brake lining. That's right, Tech. And once you explain to the driver that the transmission is only doing its job of automatic shifting, he'll understand. Yeah, and then maybe he'll start driving like he should. Do you have anything else on transmission, Paul? Yes, I do, Ed. A sticking interrupter switch. If the switch points stick together in the closed position, the coil primary circuit remains grounded. So you have no engine ignition. The engine stalls and you can't start it. Got a quick way of pinning the trouble down to the interrupter switch, Paul? Ah, uh, that I have. Try starting the engine while you watch the ammeter. If the engine doesn't start, 
and the ammeter shows a constant discharge, you'd suspect the interrupter switch. Well, cut the interrupter switch out of the circuit. You do this by removing the blue wire from the resistor in the interrupter switch circuit. That resistor is mounted with the circuit breaker on the air cleaner brace. After removing the blue wire, try starting the engine. If it starts, you'll know that the interrupter switch was causing the trouble and must be replaced. Well, if the interrupter switch points stick once, are they apt to do it all the time? No, and that's what makes it tough to find, Ed. The points are more apt to stick when the switch and the transmission are thoroughly warmed up. And when they cool off, the switch is apt to work perfectly. That's right, Tech. So if the owner says his engine stalls and he can't get it started, you better replace the interrupter switch. You know, Paul, speaking of sounds that an owner might mention hearing, what can you tell him about the clunking noise he hears occasionally when he steps on the accelerator again after an upshift? Well, that's what we call a double upshift, Mike. Remember, when you ease up on the accelerator, the upshift starts. That means the direct speed clutch sleeve is moved into engagement with the main drive pinion. But how complete that engagement is depends to some extent on how fast the driver is trying to make the shift. When you gun the engine hard in third and then take your foot all the way off the accelerator for the upshift, there isn't much of a time interval between the time that the engine driving load comes off the gears and the engine braking load is put on these same gears. Now, when this happens, the engine braking effect may delay full engagement of the direct speed clutch sleeve with the main drive pinion until you push in on the accelerator again. Then that clunking noise is the direct speed clutch sleeve moving into full engagement with the main drive pinion, right? Right you are, Mike. The condition is normal. You might explain to the driver that letting up on the accelerator long enough to allow the upshift to be completed will give him a smooth, continuous upshift without the clunking. If he hurries the shift, this double upshift condition is more apt to occur. Say, Paul, the owner of that Plymouth over there says he gets gear clashing when he shifts into low or reverse. I took it out and road tested it, and I didn't get any clashing. Looks like another case of driver education, huh, Paul? It sure does, Tech. You usually find this condition reported by an owner that's always in a hurry to get into gear and on his way. In other words, if he'd wait a couple of seconds for the countershaft gear to slow down before he shifted, he wouldn't get the clashing, huh? Right, Mike. You ought to see how my girl drives. Oh, brother. She thinks she can start shifting at the same time she shoves in the clutch. I told her about it, and she thinks the transmission ought to be changed instead of her driving habits. <laughs> well, that sure is a way of making the gears clash, all right. But what about changing the transmission lubricant? Wouldn't that help cut down gear clashing? Yes, it would, Mike. We all know that SAE 10W engine oil does a good job of lubricating. Makes for easy shifting by reducing lubricant drag on the gears. But it does let the flywheel action of the clutch spin the main drive pinion and the countershaft gear momentarily after the clutch is disengaged. That's where SAE 80 gear lubricant comes in handy. It's just enough heavier so it'll help slow the gears down. When you get a customer that can't change his habits, try changing a transmission lubricant to SAE 80. Weren't you going to tell us something about brakes, Paul? Yes, I'd like to talk... Oh, hold it right there, Paul. Somebody better turn this record over. We've talked from time to time about methods of reducing brake noise. And I'd like to review the story on brake shoe alignment, since that is perhaps the major cause of noise. And cam pin height is the most important factor in shoe alignment. Right, Tech. When the cam pin is just the right height, the guide spring holds the web of the shoe against the end of the cam pin, so that the pin acts as a guide to keep the shoe square with the drum. If the cam pin is too short, the guide spring may push on the web of the shoe enough to cock the shoe. And then the shoe won't line up square with the drum. When you apply the brakes, the outside edge of the shoe will contact the drum first. Why does that make the brake noisy? Well, Ed, by the time the shoe comes into full contact with the drum, the web of the shoe moves away from the cam pin so that the pin can't act as a support. That condition tends to let the shoe vibrate and causes noise. Now, too high a cam pin will push the shoe out of alignment with the drum and you'll get contact on the inner edge of the shoe as you apply the brake. 
This will cause brake noise, too. Then the first thing you do is check the height of the cam pin. Right, Ed. If the pin is too high, you'll have to file a little off the end. And if it's too low, you may have to replace the support plate. And don't forget them rubber anti-squeak washers. They'll help get rid of front brake pinch-out squeak. That's right, Tech. And these washers are easy to install. Try fitting one between the web of the shoe and the cam plate. If the washer won't quite go, you'll know that it's thick enough to do the insulating job. But if the washer slides easily between the web of the shoe and the cam plate, the cam pin is too high. So file a little off the end of the cam pin so the washer will do its insulating job. Is this rubber anti-squeak washer the only method of correcting brake noise, Paul? No, it isn't, Ed. Suppose we go over the various methods and find out when and how they're used. On early 51 models, the brake support plate was made heavier and a plastic button was used in the cam pins of front and rear brakes. This button acts as an insulator between the cam pin and the web of the shoe. Later, in the rear brakes of the Plymouth and Dodge Wayfarer, this plastic button was replaced with a steel button to eliminate brake howl. At the present time, we have another change in the rear brake support plate on the Plymouth and Dodge Wayfarer. The height of the cam pin boss has been increased to give support to the brake shoe without using the buttons. Well, how can I tell these new support plates from the old ones, Paul? Easy, Ed. These new support plates can be identified by this raised circular section just below the guide spring attaching rivets. And remember, you don't use any buttons with this new support plate. Say, speaking of brakes, what can you do to stop wire brush noise? I've noticed it on some cars. In fact, my own car has it at slow speeds, say around 10 miles an hour. Got any suggestions? Sure. Your car doesn't have brake drum damping springs. Put them on each brake drum right around the outside of the drum. That'll reduce the noise. But you want to remember, there are other ways of reducing brake noise that we can use, such as cam grinding of the brake linings, for example. Now, are there any other questions on brakes? Say, I've got one, Paul. Just what is the right way to connect up the wires to the stoplight switch? The boys with the scientific test instruments tell me you should connect the red wire to the long terminal of the stoplight switch. That's the way I heard it, too. They say it makes the stoplight switch last longer. Say, Paul, there's an engine mount noise that can be mistaken for brake noise. You better tell them about it. Yes, that is a tough noise to find. A dull snapping noise that you can hear just as the car comes to a stop following a sudden brake application. Now, this sound could be caused by several conditions, but I'd check the engine rear mounts to see if they were loose in the holes in the cross member. What's the best way to check them, Paul? Well, one of the best ways I've found is to use a pry bar to shift the engine back and forth in the frame member. If you hold one hand on the edge of the flanged washer when you do this shifting, you'll be able to feel the movement of the mount. Then I suppose you shim up the hole. Right, Ed. By lifting the mounts and placing a piece of shim stock at the rear of the mount hole. Just bend one end of the shim stock down into the hole and place the mount back in. If you make a fringe on one end of the shim with three cuts about five-eighths inches long, you can bend the shim at right angle to the cuts so it'll curve right around the inside of the mounting hole. Hey, Paul, can you spare a minute? Looks like your boy Ken's got troubles. What you got, Ken? It's these shocks on Mr. Johnson's car. He says they're noisy. What'll I do, replace them? Whoa, let's not rush into things. You want to remember these Oroflow shocks operate on a different principle than previous shocks. Oroflow shocks were designed to operate with low resistance when compressed slowly. In addition, the shocks provide greater resistance when moved at high speeds. Now, in order to give these good ride characteristics, each orifice or passageway in the piston of the shock has been reduced in size and used to control the flow of fluid. This reduction in size of the orifice causes an increase in the speed of the fluid as it passes from one side of the piston to the other during the compression stroke. And sometimes the speed of the fluid as it passes through the orifice is so great you can actually hear it when you hit a rough spot in the road. That's what Mr. Johnson hears. 
That's right. If you explain to the customer what's causing the noise and that it's a normal condition, he won't worry about it. You know, Paul, I've noticed that fluid seems to leak out of some of these shocks. Well, usually that isn't leakage, Mike, but surplus fluid that remains on the piston rod during assembly and works down on the lower tube. The lower tube may be covered with dirt and oil, but still be working all right. You'd have to thoroughly test the shock before you replaced it. Well, how would you test it? By using a bench test, the same as we test other types of shocks? No, you can't check Oroflow shocks in the usual way, Ken. Because of the low compression rates, the bench test won't prove anything. How about the old standby bumper test, then? Will that work? No, and for the same reason, Mike. You can't move the car up and down fast enough to indicate the condition of these new shocks. Actually, the only effective way of checking the Oroflow shock absorbers is a test ride. Drive the car over different types of roads to get a true picture of the ride qualities of the shock. That's the only effective way to tell, Mike. Hey, this outfit of yours is really on the beam, Paul. Wish I had a couple of more hours to spend with you and your boys, but I gotta move along. So long, Jack. Thanks for the tip. Don't mention it, my boy. If you boys will pass along this information to the owners, they'll understand what makes these noises and quit worrying about them. So long. <laughs> <laughs>